Welcome back to another reading of The Adventures of Lord Blackwood, Explorer and Gentleman, dear researchers. Today we're going to be reading A Most Unfortunate Reunion, brought to us by Smapti. A Most Unfortunate Reunion Dr. Matthew Eggers, special assistant for sapient animal research at Site-19, sat at a bare table in interview room C, a notepad in his hand. In front of him, crawling back and forth across the table, was the creature that had occupied so much of his time for the last six months, SCP-1867, a telepathic English-speaking sea slug that claimed to be Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood, a 19th-century British gentleman and explorer in a severe state of denial about his physical form. Lord Blackwood, as insisted on being called, was relating yet another fabulous and improbable tale of his adventures, and, as he had done three times a week for months now, Eggers was taking down the self-proclaimed scientist's words on his notepad. Thus far, the Foundation had yet to decisively verify a single one of his anecdotes, but if even half of his claimed encounters with other contained objects were true, then there was a wealth of information in the slug's head that would be of great use in the Foundation's work. There I was, Lord Blackwood exclaimed, thousands of feet above the forests of Baden, my eyes level with the peak of the Feldberg itself, my legs wrapped for dear life around the neck of an Austrian green dragon, one hand feverishly clutching the reins as I struggled to bring myself about. The saddle had fallen to the ground when I cut it loose, taking the beast's Prussian rider with it. I had expended my last rounds of ammunition, fleeing Count von Zeppelin's airborne war machine before it caught a flame and fell to the earth. I managed to cajole the dragon into turning back towards the east, and that's when I caught sight of a Truly massive dragon, one of the rare Grand Romanov breed, imported from Russia, bedecked in burnished steel armor that shone impossibly bright as it caught the last rays of the evening sun. There upon its back I saw my quarry, Kaiser Friedrich III himself. On any other day I would never have dared to test my prowess against the man who was, after all, the husband of our dear queen's daughter. But now that the eye of Lakshmi itself, that famed Hindustani amulet with the power to carry a man's soul into a new body after death, was in the hands of the Second Reich, I was left with no recourse. I drove the dragon straight at the Kaiser's and called forth from its lips a burst of flame that the Hun barely evaded. As I turned about to make another pass, I saw him blow into a massive hunting horn that echoed across the mountains and valleys of the Schwarzwald. And to my horror, another half-dozen dragons rose out of the opaque canopies below, fresh and ready for the fight. I was outnumbered and outgunned. The last of England's finest Drake men had been felled by von Zeppelin's contraption. A fusiliers on the ground forced to retreat by the German cavalry advance. I had only one hope to win the day. Holding on to the reins for dear life, I reached into my pack and carefully withdrew the oddly shaped red vase that housed the most unusual of benefactors. I'm sorry, Lord Blackwood, Dr. Edgars interrupted. Ah, uh, but I'm gonna have to cut you off there. It's going to take me the rest of the day to translate all this from the shorthand and the rest of the week for the staff to go over it. We'll have to finish the story during the next interview, all right? Dash it all. Lord Blackwood replied. I was just getting to the good part. Very well, I suppose I'll have to leave you in suspense for another week. I'm glad you understand, Eggers said as he rose from the chair and made his way to the door. Just wait right there and Dr. 
Andrews will be by in a few minutes to take you back to your tank. About that, my dear boy, Lord Blackwood said. Do you think you could finally see your way to draining all that excess water out? I appreciate a good swim as much as the next fellow, but my skin has begun far too wrinkled as of late. I'll pass that on to the director, Eggers said. The door closed behind him, and Lord Blackwood was alone. Or so he thought. From the air vent near the ceiling of the room, an interloper had been observing in secret the conversation between the doctor and the slug, waiting for exactly this moment. As Lord Blackwood turned his back to the vent, idly crawling about and humming a land of hope and glory to himself, he made his move. Slowly and silently, he exited the vent and made his way down the floor and to the table, inch by inch, minute by minute. The unexpected guest made his way across the wooden surface, following Lord Blackwood's slime trail until he was almost right behind the slug at the table's edge. And then... Oi, Tommy! Lord Blackwood had moved on to singing bits and pieces of the Pirates of Penzance, when the silence was broken by a loud cry in a vulgar London patois. The nuda branch half instinctively attempted to reach for his hip before recalling that he was not carrying a gun, and instead turned himself around as fast as one in his condition could do so, and found himself face to face with the last thing he had expected. So rude a call to emanate from. A common snail, its pulsating eye stalks fixed directly on him. In all his years of adventuring, Lord Blackwood had never encountered so bizarre a thing as a talking snail. Nonetheless, he took a deep breath and gave the creature a stern glare of his own as he replied, Who the devil are you, and how do you know my name? Oh, come on, Tommy, the snail replied in a dialect that made Lord Blackwood cringe. Surely you haven't forgotten the face of your dear old friend Georgie, have you? George Philip Harris IV, Lord Blackwood sneered. I should have recognized that guttural nonsense you have the audacity to call English right away. What are you doing here? Need to borrow money? On the run from the Swiss Guard? Perhaps you've concocted another ridiculous scheme to defraud the Americans out of the territories. You and I got some unfinished business to settle, Tommy, Harris said. You kill me back in 55? You think a man just forgets a thing like that? Lord Blackwood rolled his eyes. Not this rot again. I thought we'd settled this after that business in Patagonia. And yet here we are, Harris said. How many times have I gotten myself turned inside out because you're too busy ogling the glory to save your old pal from Godolphin House? I'll tell you the same thing I told you then. You brought all that upon yourself when you decided to try and smuggle the crown of Setuk up the Nile. You're a pint of old bitter if I ever seen one, had a spat on the ground. And where were you and half the mummies west of the Nile were after me? Half the back to London to kiss the Queen's knickers? I was in Alexandria helping the Patriarch, the Coptic Pope, and the Grand Mufti arrange the biggest exorcism conducted in Egypt since the fall of the Abbasids, Lord Blackwood responded, the impatient in his voice mounting. Were it not for what we pulled off, Africa itself would have been lost to the British Empire because of your foolish attempt at larcenry. We've played this game before, Tommy, Harris said. Every time I let you tag along on one of my grand expeditions, 
you wander off and get me killed. And the next time you come around asking for me help to line your pockets with foreign gold, you've always, always got some cock and bull story about how it's not your fault. You shouldn't have let the Sumerian godman out of his gasket. You shouldn't have tried to kill the golem of Prague with the derringer. You shouldn't have seduced the gypsy king's sister. I've had it up to here. Harris swept his eye stalk in a line above his hand. You and I are gonna settle this ear and now like real gentlemen. Lord Blackwood sighed and swore under his breath, struggling to keep his composure. Only one of us is a gentleman, Mr. Harris. And while the years have not been as kind to me as I might have hoped they would, you are hardly in a state to fight me. I warped you soundly every time we met in the boxing ring back in Essen, and as I recall, you had not, at the time, been transmogrified into a snail. A snail? A bloody snail? Have you lost your mind? Harris threw back his head and laughed. I'm as fit as I've ever been, and I ain't been turned into no bleeding sea slug either. Lord Blackwood puffed himself up with rage. So, I should have known you were the black god spreading these foul slanders about my being a sea slug. I demand satisfaction and demand it now, Harris. A recant of these lies at once, or I shall be forced to give you what for. All right, all right, tell me. Don't get your pants in a twist, Harris said, grinning slightly. You're right. You're right, you ain't a sea slug, but your mum sure is. Lord Blackwood cocked back his right eye stalk and swung. Addendum Sometime in the 2000s, a Roman snail, Helix pomatina, with anomalous properties similar to SCP-1867, was found in interview room C after SCP-1867 had briefly been left unobserved following the conclusion of interview 1867-238. At the time of discovery, SCP-1867 and the snail were observed face-to-face -face on a table attempting to headbutt each other and strike each other with their eye stalks. In subsequent interviews, the snail has identified itself as George Philip Harris IV, an individual referred to as an associate of SCP-1867, beginning in Diary 1867-3. The snail is currently being housed in a 40 by 70 by 30 centimeter specimen tank adjacent to SCP-1867s, until such time as further examination and classification can be made. Oi, Tommy! Lord Blackwood turned his head and did his best to ignore Harris's shouts from the tank next to his. Did you ever hear of the one about the man who thought he was a botfly? Got nicked for indecency after he started running up to ladies and batting them on the arm. Said he was looking for some place to lay his eggs. By Jove, Lord Blackwood thought to himself. What I wouldn't give for an elephant gun right now. And with that oh so wonderfully terrible London accent over with, that is the end of our reading today. Thank you very much for coming, dear researchers. It has been an honor, as always, reading for you. Good luck out there, and I hope to see you all next time.